G'day, I'm Max Tweedy, and welcome to a special episode in the Cattle Country series, where we bring you the ANZ Meet the Market Barbecue Panel from the 2014 National Field Days. New Beef and Lamb Chairman James Parsons talks New Zealand's progress in lifting agricultural productivity. Neat Meats founder Simon Erickson explains the benefits of branded programs and value-added strategies. Graham Turley of ANZ encourages thought leadership in the sector and the need to invest in pasture renewal. And Mark Brown of Agricom explains the benefits of feeding the genetic potential of our cattle with the right forage for the right markets. Let's hear what wisdom has come from these four wise men yarning over a piece of steak. Step forward, chaps. Um, look, one at a time, uh, where are we? So come over here. Simon Erickson uh, from Neat Meats. Neat Meats is a uh, great company doing amazing things at the moment, uh, uh, going from strength to strength. Hello, Simon. Thanks for the intro, Damien. Very kind. Tell, tell us a little bit about Neat Meats. Yeah, Neat Meats, we started um, more by accident, I suppose, 14 years ago. Like a lot of people at the time, couldn't get a job anywhere else, so sort of stumbled into somewhere in between the meat industry and, and hospitality. And, uh, you know, the last 14 years we've been enjoying the, the spoils of what New Zealand farmers have been, been producing for us. So what we're going to be doing here uh, over the next uh, 20 minutes or so is we're going to be cooking up some steaks, some of Simon's neat meats, in fact, is that right? Yes, yes that's yes, true. Yes. Yep, yep. Um, and we're going to be having a little bit of chat about uh, the red meat industry uh, from basically from meat all the way back to, uh, to feed and uh, what ANZ's got to do with that as well, if we can just slip that in somehow, uh, we can do that. So uh, next up we've got um, James Parsons, who's the chairman of Beef and Lamb. Hello, James. Welcome back. Now, um, now, beef and lamb uh, are responsible for marketing beef and lamb to the New Zealand market. What else? Yes, yeah, so we, we look after, obviously, promotion, uh, fund half of the domestic promotion through Beef and Lamb New Zealand Inc. And, um, and then also do a lot of work in R&D, um, extension activities, so taking the research uh, through, to, through to farmers, through extension activities, field days, etc. And then also promoting the product offshore, about 40% of Beef and Lamb's budget is invested offshore in um, market access and also promoting the product. And then people people programs and information analysis. I can see people um, eyeing up the steak actually. So Simon, would you like to do the honours uh, on, maybe on this barbecue over here and get some of the steak going? People want some steak, yeah? How would you like it done, sir? Uh, medium well. Medium well? Medium well. Yeah. Well, <laughs> how, sir, how would you like your steak done? Medium rare. Medium rare. Same, medium rare all around? Uh, medium, you, you'll settle for a medium rare, won't you? Yep, good. Okay, good. There's no choices, medium rare. Um, and uh, next up we've got um, Graham uh, Turley, who's the Managing Director of Commercial and Agri from ANZ. Hello, Graham. Yeah, how are you? Good, good thanks. Yeah. What brings you to Field Days? Brings me to Field Days, well, I guess we're the strategic partner here, and, um, you know, it's just a fun place to be, to, to meet up with some really exciting agri people in the agricultural industry, and that's good. And... Um, we're here today to showcase some of our fantastic product, which is really, 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 really nice. So um, I'm sure everybody there is waiting to piece a piece of steak that we're, the, we're the, cooking. The steak is disappearing before my eyes, actually. And uh, we've also got Mark Brown here, uh, for, who's the Australasian Agricom brand manager for uh, PGG Wrightsons uh, for New Zealand Seed and Grain. Welcome along. Thank you, Damien. What's Good your here. role in the whole, you know, um, cow to steak process? The forage part is where we come into it. So. Um, our whole goal in life, I guess, our R&D aim is to breed uh, more productive, more persistent foragers and foragers that produce more on the shoulders of the season so that we can um, uh, aid farmers in hitting some of these, the premiums and, and the niche markets with their, the products that they're uh, targeting to, to finish. Great. Now, um, can I talk to Simon while he's, while he's doing the barbecue? Actually, someone else step up to the barbecue. There we go. Don't ruin it. We want medium rare all round, remember. Um, Simon, now when uh, Neat Meat started up uh, 2001, what was the market like then compared to how it is now for premium oh, meat? It was very different. Um, the, the farmers were doing their thing, the process were doing their thing, and the chefs were doing their thing, and it was very um, separated, if you like. So I suppose when we got involved, uh, it was quite competitive. There wasn't any branding. Angus Pure was probably the best, first beef brand that we engaged with in 2003. But, you know, people would, uh, chefs would naturally move on for 10 cents here or there. You know, that's what it came down to. And, you know, so the last 13 years about developing brands, really. Uh, and Angus Pure has taught us a lot about what, what the market will accept. And, 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 and we've been getting better and better as we've gone on. What sort of, uh, just for a, for a background, what sort of meat are we looking at here today? This is Angus. Um, we personally uh, enjoy selling the, the black animal just because it's globally 
quite easy to brand and market. Um, it's very reliable, you know, throughout the year. Uh, so in this particular instance, we're using um, a two to three mar uh, uh, scotch fillet. So it comes off a carcass of about 230, 240 kgs max. And uh, it's perfect in terms of its size for the average restaurant plate. And so this has been aged for about four weeks. James, um, Angus, how, what sort of role does Angus have in uh, New Zealand's uh, beef industry? Yeah, Angus is a uh, very significant breed, so um, I forget the exact, exact percentage, but if you take dairy beef out of it, Angus would be, well, pretty close to 50%. Has um, that been changing? Has that been growing? Yeah, look, to be fair, you know, the Angus team have done a very good job around branding, and so there's, uh, you know, not just New Zealand wide, but uh, but internationally, and so, you know, there's no question that when you're those in the sort of Angus um, game that are selling bulls have actually got quite sort of good demand for their bulls and that's, that's going well, real credit to them around how they've promoted the product. Are they able to get a premium that you wouldn't get from other types of breeds? Yeah, no, there's, there is some, uh, you know, for dedicated to supply programs around Angus and they are getting some, some premiums at the farm gate for some of that if they're in a proper program, yeah. Now, I'm going to talk to, um, over on the, on the feed side of things, hello there, there we go. So when you've got the different types of um, animals, different types of farms, different types of feed, is that how it works? Different products? Yeah, probably more seasonally orientated. Um, I think with our grasses, everything grows in the springtime. So, so we can, anyone can grow grass in the springtime. But as I alluded to earlier, it's actually the shoulders of the season that often make the difference. And I think one thing that we've really sort of come to notice in the last few years is the use of some of these more alternative forages like chicory and plantain, for example, which have got real strengths and attributes through uh, the late spring, the summer and the autumn. And again, enabling a more consistent year-round supply of, uh, of some of these top quality products. And uh, uh, Graham, what do you think about that? <laughs> I was uh, just trying to catch him out. You've got to pay yeah, attention, yeah. Graham. Oh, I was. We were yeah. talking about the industry <laughs> and pastures. Yeah. Now... You are looking at um, pastoral renewal, very important to farmers, pastoral renewal, it's yeah. a, um, you're doing special pastoral renewal loans at the moment? Is that yeah, right? you know, we, um, we've got our pastoral renewal loans and really what it's about is encouraging farmers to improve productivity, you know, and also, you know, the good thing about good pastures, not only can you get, um, you know, fatter lambs or, or better, better, better milk in the cows, but it's also another way to manage through climate conditions if you have the right sort of right crops and the right seeds, especially if you buy them off PD that the right seed. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, part of a lot of what we're trying to do and part of our proposition really is thought leadership is about creating or helping farmers run their businesses so they're more productive, making more money, so therefore they can make really good decisions in the long term and sustainability. And so our, our pasture renewal is part of that. It's part of the environment, sustainability, increasing productivity and pro pro probability. James, probability. You, James, you do a lot of research in this, in this area. How much... Uh, what sort of efficiency gains can farmers get, that sort of thing, by looking at changing the way that they use feed and those sorts of things? Yeah, so no, there's um, there's a lot of gains to be had. You know, and we, there's quite a lot of variation between farm profitability and uh, you know some of that's driven around productivity. Some things just around you know more business management, etc. Um, but generally, you know, there's where where a farmer's got a, a good stock stock policy line up the utilising the pasture well and they're growing a lot of dry matter, um, generally those are very very good high performance businesses. I asked this yesterday um, at the dairy session that we had, uh, out of 10, most New Zealand beef farmers, how well are they doing at the moment efficiency wise, get it maximising their returns, that sort of thing, out of 10, what do you reckon? Out of 10? Oh look, I think you, you know, this is the old evil word of averages isn't it, <laughs> but uh, you know, I think there's probably, you know, Look, it's a really difficult question in a lot of ways. That's Jamie, what I'm here for. Where, where, where on the spectrum is? Um, so, look, is there a ra is there a range, big range? There is. Yeah, absolutely. So, look, they probably the scale goes from one to ten, doesn't it? Right. Um, but you know, where, where would they be average? Well, I guess you know, five or six. Um, but then, if you benchmark us against internationally, around other other producers around the globe, you know, New Zealand is a world leader around pasture utilisation and and how we do things. So, um, look, it's, 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 it's all pretty relative, really. But uh, the exciting thing is, you know, this is where we look at it from a Beef and Lamb New Zealand perspective, is um, the opportunity to improve is significant. And so it's about how do we get better information out to farmers, help them to make profitable decisions, not just about production, but actually making more profit, and, um, and lining them up so that we have a, a stronger, more resilient business and, and sector going forward. And I think that's really exciting. When we look at the opportunities there, they are very significant. So... So that's, that's uh, how we assist farmers. Obviously there's those in the marketplace that do a lot of work too. Um, so Beef and Lamb New Zealand isn't the only sector player, but uh, we certainly help them contribute. Who's had some steak already? Who's tried it? Well, we've got a well done, you... uh, well done steak for the gentleman over here. Oh so, yeah, okay, uh, good. Yeah. Who liked this? Who enjoyed this steak? How was your steak, sir? 
We haven't had it yet. Can we get this man some steak over here, please? Right. Stat. Was, uh, stat. <laughs> you're after the well done, were you? We've, we've murdered the steak for you. Yeah. In terms of, it, when it comes to beef, is it na nature, nature or nurture? So, look, I think the, the key thing, genetics um, set the potential in terms of um, eating quality and growth rate, and things like that. But um, you'll never realise that potential unless you, you actually nurture them really well. So, you know, 90% of, of genetics award, you know, performance is really probably in the feeding. Now, that's a subjective subjective assessment, but it does, um, you know, essentially, you know, you will never achieve your genetic potential unless, unless you're looking after them well. And so that's where, you know, when you get those two in tandem, a really good farmer who manages well, plus um, have the right genetics, you know, it's a, it's a real winning combination. Yeah, Mark, what do you have to add to that? I mean, the, the role that grain, the right grains play in getting a, an animal that's been bred really well to, you know, to, yeah. its, to its full potential. Yeah, and I, and I think you see that really when you compare some of our farm systems and feed systems with what there is in the States, for example. I would argue that genetically there would probably, you know, not be an animal in New Zealand that if you, if you didn't feed it better, it wouldn't perform better. So I think the potential's there uh, with all classes of animals that if you do feed them better, you'll be rewarded for that. And as I say, um, you look at some of these feed systems, very different to, to here, of course, but in the US where they absolutely pile feed uh, down the throats of animals, the, uh, the returns are quite impressive from a, from a productivity perspective. So yeah, uh, feeding is a, is a huge part of it, and the more we can do that, uh, the more consistently through the seasons, the more efficient our system is around uh, producing either milk or, or lamb or whatever the, um, uh, the item may be. Does it have an impact on flavour, what you feed them? You know, you are what you eat, that sort of thing? Yeah, there's actually quite a bit of work being done in that space. Um, and with some of our herb products, we are finding that, um, for example, there's been quite a bit of work done with chicory, and it appears that there may be some niche markets, international markets for, for lamb finished on chicory. Uh, conversely, in the brassica space, uh, there's a, there could be an argument that, um, you know, that some markets don't appreciate... Uh, the flavour or the, or the cooking smell that comes off some of those. So there's a lot of work going on in that space to, to try and sort of fit forages with markets, if you like. Simon, do you, do you want to just uh, add to that? Uh, James, if you could just jump on the barbie for a second there. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a whiskey drinker. I don't know about you, but you can get the whiskies that have been finished off in different casks to make them taste differently. Is it, could we do that with beef and lamb? Can you, you know... Oh, absolutely. Um, I'd probably liken it more to wine. Yeah. Step down from whiskey. Yep. Um, you know, wine. the wine people, reps, have done a wonderful job of selling wine that all look the same. Same colour, same size bottle, from a distance, same label. Yet there might be $10 for that one and $100 for that. So we've taken a lot of learnings from the wine industry and how we market stuff. But behind the scenes, just going off from the diet thing, um, we sell a, a brand called Wakanui, and that's Angus beef finished on grain for 70, 90 days. And it's quite a different product to... The grass-fed beef in the North Island, which is quite a bit different to the grass-fed beef we sell in the South Island, which is quite a bit different on the West Coast and the East Coast. So we push control probably 80% of our beef, and um, we see, depending where it comes from, the New Zealand. I don't really know the diet other than the Wakanui, but there's a clear difference between the colour of the meat, the colour of the fat, and the eating quality from around the country. I wonder, if, could we do a blind testing with you right now? I've got two different uh, types. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, do you reckon you yeah. can spot it? Um, yes, <laughs> yeah, that's the right, and up, that is the correct answer, Simon. Well done. Um, what sort of um, I want? I, we, we touched on pastoral renewal before. I just want to talk about that a lot, a little bit more. Um, what uh, you know? What's important to uh, focus on when you're looking at pastoral renewal farmers? I think the the program, the planning, like anything, is is all important. I mean, it's it's a significant investment. Uh, just to give you some numbers, if you're talking on a per hectare basis, it's going to cost you about $1,000 to go from woe to go. So that's the spray out, the cultivation, the seed cost, the drilling, the chemical and so on. So, so that's a, you know, that is quite a, an investment. So I guess my advice would be, you know, don't do it half-heartedly. It's, it's a lot of money to spend. Uh, the prize really is, is how long that pasture will last you, how productive it will be over time. But the good news is that, um, you know, there's been dozens of in industry trials and evaluations and, and commercial evaluation around how profitable this is. And I guess uh, if you look at it over five years, the reward is about $5,000. So about uh, $1,500 per year is your return over and above a unrenewed pasture. So you can, you can put, 
put dollars and numbers around that, whichever way you look at it from a, from a milk solids production, a lamb finishing, a selling and trading perspective, it's, uh, it's highly profitable. But um, back to the question, I think there are a number of things that you need to get right in that planning process, and obviously that's, that's what we're here to do. What's the first sign that you should be looking at pastoral renewal? Is that an obvious question? Yeah, look, the, uh, scoring your farm is, is a great way to start, or a great place to start, and I think if you use a one to five system, you know, your fives are great, your ones are not so good, they might be dominated by weeds, it could be, you know, low lying uh, um, paddocks that are prone to pugging or what have you, but I think uh, from a dairy farmer's perspective it's a lot easier because you can, you can pick that up in the vat, um, but probably for a sheep and beef guy you're looking for, for legume component, uh, you're looking for how much of your paddock uh, mid spring for example or, or, or mid to late summer is made up of weed or, or other undesirables. So there's a very simple sort of a grading system that we would use that would sort of, you know, there's a number of triggers that would drive that. Graham, I just wanted to ask, so, you know, a lot of farmers already have a big loan, it's called a mortgage, um, rather than getting a, you know, a specific pastoral renewal loan, what's the difference between just chucking it on the mortgage? Well, it's a bit cheaper for a start. Um, I guess the real difference is, is if you want a pastoral renewal loan, that's what you have to use the money for, and you have to have a plan for it and um, demonstrate to us that you're going to put a new pasture in. So that's the key thing, absolutely the key thing there. So it's all about, you know... We're there to help you improve productivity on your farm and create a more sustainable business. Mark makes it sound like it makes quite good economic sense. The bank's quite quite keen to uh, look at people looking to do this. A absolutely, things that make economic sense, we're definitely here to support, <laughs> and um, that's the whole purpose. You know, we feel like if we, uh, if, we, if our customers are coming and asking us for pastoral renewal loans, we're happy to give them to them because they're the sort of people that are investing in their business. The people that are actually looking to grow their business, if you grow, we grow, and um, we're all a happy family. So that's. Um, it's good for New Zealand, good for you, and good for us. I see Chef's about to bring around the last uh, last round of steak, which, steaks, which are going to go pretty quickly, I imagine. I haven't tried any yet. I need to, I need to get me some of that. Um, any questions um, from, from the audience here that you'd like to ask? Just a reminder who we've got here, the, uh, the stars. We've got um, Simon from Neat Meats. Uh, we've got Mark uh, from PGG Wrightsons, James from Beef and Lamb, uh, and Graham from ANZ. Any questions for our panel? I'll just repeat the question so everyone can hear it. Why is it when you do a home kill, you get a better tasting bit of meat than you do from the supermarket? It's probably the number one question that comes up. And I, <coughs> I'd say because you're maybe emotionally attached to that animal. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 honestly, I, I think, it, again, using wine, people... Supermarkets fall into that trap where people have already made an assessment on the meat before they've eaten it. Um, and it's a, it is, and it's attachment. So... There's a lot of science that's gone into that. I mean, you may have treated your animal with a bit of, bit more love than maybe the, where the supermarket's getting this from. I don't know, but there are, you know, it, it, as I say, in the freezer itself, uh, the freezer's no-go zone in terms of um, where you put your meat because it's always going to downgrade everything. You know, as the ice crystals form in a slow freeze, it just bursts the, the muscle tissue, so you're never going to have a good good eat. I always argue with the farmers over the home cool scenario. I say, if you give that animal to the meatworks, take the money they've given it to you and then send it to me, I reckon I can fill your freezer or your fridge up with more of the meat that you'd probably want rather than sort of 80% mince. But that's an argument we can have for another day. <laughs> Very good. Do you think that um, people are starting to get more savvy, you know, retail customers as to what a good bit of meat is? Yeah, I think they're getting more demanding. I think um, there's a real war going on there at the moment with supermarkets to try and price, you know, and it doesn't work for the farmers, it doesn't work for the industry when it is a price game, but that could only go so far. Now that sort of threshold of people wanting better quality food, not just meat, is, is growing. And it's probably enforced by the chefs and the programs on television with regards to, you know, every program you watch has got something to do with a chef cooking food. And so it's just out there in the open now, people just want more. And also the culture, the dining out culture has exploded in New Zealand. The last three years it's gone nuts, so that's a positive too for us. Part of the um, secret to your success, I think, um, if I'm not giving away too many of your secrets, is getting a good bit of meat, making it look nice, packaging it well, and then being able to sell it for more. Do you think New Zealand needs to do more of that, especially overseas? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's probably taking a, take, take an example um, with the stuff we're seeing in the supermarkets with Silver Fern. I don't know how that works in the local market, but adding value for export with those sort of things, I mean, we're better off selling a 200 gram portion in a box than we are a contained load of sirloins, you know what I mean? So it's, it's the, the way I see, you know, we've all read the Deloitte's report and how we add value, how we grow the agri, well, you know, the dairy farms are entering into our industry every day, so that puts pressure on us. So the only way we're going to do it is by selling our meat for more. And with the steak of origin, 
every year we enter probably two or three uh, different stakes from different farms around the country and there's a trend certainly with the uh, tenderness results that come back. Those that are being trucked further away, even though they've probably got fantastic bred cattle and win numerous awards and do consistently well with bull sales, tend to struggle a little bit when the cattle are sitting in a truck for longer than five or six hours. But you know, some people don't have any choices and that's just the... James, do you want to talk to that? Actually, that's interesting. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the stake of origin. Um, you know, you can you can spend a lot of money getting a well-bred cow, cattle, uh, not cow, that's a rookie mistake, um, you know, fair, that's what we'll call it, yep, um, and we can feed it the best feed, best chicory, the best this, best that, finish it off well, but you can all be ruined on the way to the on the way to the plant? Yeah, no, that's, it's right through the supply chain, so, you know, those, and look, your, your point's absolutely valid, if you've got a, an animal that's, that's really stressed, and, uh, you know, so the pH goes right up and the colour goes wrong, you know, naturally it's, that's not going to be a great eating, eating um, experience, but, uh, so, you know, it's, it's about sort of having all those cogs in the chain all working, um, you know, seamlessly as possible. And so, you know, meat companies now have got some pretty good QA standards around processing. There's always room for improvement. Briefly, too, about the Red Meat Profit Partnership. Yeah, sure. So the Red Meat Profit Partnership's a $64 million sort of collaboration um, with processors, Beef and Lamb New Zealand, ANZ and, and, uh, and one other bank. And, and working around um, how do we start building a more resilient sort of farmer base? So there's, there's quite a few components in it, it's a, it's a lot of breadth to it, so say 64 million, it's over seven years, um, and that's half funded by government through the Primary Growth Partnership Programme. And so really the, the big objective is how do we, there's, there's a lot of opportunity right through the supply chain, post farm gate, uh, guys like Simon do a great job, you know, lifting the value of the product, that's fantastic. There's also opportunities um, within the procurement sort of processing space, but this one is clearly focused around how do we build that farmer base. And um, so, you know, some of the stuff that, that uh, Mark was talking about earlier and, and Graham around regrassing. So, you know, how does a farmer know exactly where the best point of intervention is in their business? You know, maybe it is regrassing, but there's, if we needed farmers to start measuring this stuff and benchmarking and finding this out. So, Got a big component in there around benchmarking. So if you can look at your business and you know farm accountants getting on board, farm consultants, etc., saying right, just some high-level indicators around how your business is performing, and get some standardisation around that. So currently we have all sorts of measures, and uh, we want to just have a, a, just a basket of really key ones, and then say right, if if you're operating at the 90th percentile around um, production, there's probably not a lot of gain to be had by regrassing. But if you're operating at the 50th percentile around profit. Well, maybe there's some other things you need to be doing rather than regrassing. However, if you might be you're operating at a quite a low level around production, well, maybe that's where you need to be talking to, to the seed companies and looking about sort of how you can grow some more dry matter, etc. So, no business is the same, and it's about how do we sort of determine where those things are. There's a bunch of other stuff in there, but that's just just one thing to talk Gra about. Graham, what's the bank's role in uh, the Red Meat Profit Partnership? Oh, our, our role is exactly as James just pointed out. We're just, we're, a, we're a partner, uh, one of the key partners. And it's about creating you know, better on-farm management to basically, if we can get stronger, more sustainable, profitable um, sheep meat farmers, especially in the land business, then they're in a way better position to actually make a more a longer-term decision, a better decision, and for more confidence in how they deal with a processor and how they make other on-farm decisions. And, you know, I think what we've seen here today and the discussions we've had here today have been really good because, you know, we can talk about pasture renewal, we can talk about all those things, but the real key thing that's take away here is we've had the finished product. And what we've heard from Simon and from the, from the um, people here today is that if you, when you look, look at your, your product walking around the paddock, you've got to think about it in terms of what sort of a product do you want on the plate. So therefore you talk about stress, you talk about the quality of the grass. You're actually growing something to have the best product. And the apple industry, they go at great lengths to get an apple that looks like right, the right shape with the right colour so it goes to the right market. And so it gets processed with the... You know, the, like it's in cotton wool, and so when we're looking at this product, we've actually got a, we have a very much a production-led sort of mentality, like getting the lambs out as many as we can, having twins and everything else, which is fantastic because that's about profitability. But we've actually also got to have a market focus, actually. So we're going to have the focus where we start. Our goal is to produce this piece of product and work backwards. So every part of the supply chain, we treat that animal with its pristine accuracy and care so that actually we don't damage that product so when we go to market so when Silver Fern Farm or someone goes to market they can go to market with absolute confidence that they're selling something that somebody will buy and time and time again they will have confidence that it's going to be high quality and consistent so that's the key thing that's coming out of here and on the way we're going to use things like good pasture 
good um, benchmarking, good financial management to make sure you're profitable. And if you're profitable, one is you'll have fun, hopefully, but two, you'll be able to continue to invest in the business so you keep ahead of the rest of the market around the world. And that's what this is all about. So you just have a market focus, understand what's happening to your product. Right? It doesn't leave the gate and that's the end of it. You're the first part of a very valuable supply chain. Thank you.